there are a lot of stupid, dumb, and useless features in modern EVs. I've been complaining about a lot of things about modern electric cars for years now, and I thought it was time to make a top 10 list of the worst features in modern electric cars. According to me, you may disagree, and let me know in the comment section down below, what is your top 10 list before we set off with this video? And before we jump into it, this list isn't in any particular order. And there are also things that I wanted to include that were just out of reach of the top 10. So if this video gets a lot of likes, a lot of views, and a lot of comments, I may make a part two, diving into more detail about modern car features I don't like in new EVs. So with that out of the way, let's get into the list. So the first item I have is the column gear selector, which has really made a comeback the past five, the past 10 years, especially in electric cars. When I grew up, this was a thing only in American cars, especially large American SUVs that were body on frame, you know, uh, Ford Expeditions, uh, Chevrolet Tahoes and Suburbans, but they really made a comeback in modern uh, times. And the reason I don't like them is that because they take away functionality and real estate, which has for decades been dedicated to other things. For example, on the right side, for most cars, you've had, you know, the stock for your window wipers and other functions. But now with the advent of gear selectors there, that has to be reallocated to the left stock, which now has to do blinkers, wipers, lights, so many functions. And in my opinion, has really reduced the usability of cars. The second item on my list is something I call new style car keys. And I didn't have a better name for this because there are so many different type of car keys. For example, right here, I'm gonna find it here. Right here, I have a Volvo EX90 on loan. So it has this very nice pouch here, which has a key card, one of these. And this, you can tap on the door, but not where you think you're gonna tap it. There's an indentation on the right side of the door handle, but this goes on the left side where there's no markings. And then to start the car, well, I don't think you can even use this. You have to use this other one that you have to place in the phone charger, or you can use your app. But the thing about this is this, when the car does react to this being in the proximity of the car, there are no hard buttons. Um, this has been a problem in Volvos, in Polestars, in uh, other cars that have this type of proximity key without buttons. And other cars have different solutions. There are so many ways to unlock a car. Now, my friend was borrowing this. Uh, I had a visitor how, how, uh, over Christmas, and he's like, Why, what happened to the car key? Why just not use a normal car key? with buttons, why does everything have to be in so many different form factors and be so minimalistic that it takes away the actual function of the key, which is to unlock the car and start the vehicle. Third on the list is super minimalistic interiors. And there are a whole bunch of subcategories to this, which I can make my own video on, and some of them are here. But the thing about these super minimalistic interiors is that, first off, they are cost-cutting for the manufacturers. They make the cars easier and cheaper to make and to build and to manufacture. But on the other hand, we then have, you know, a lot of physical buttons, physical controls, and screens. Like, for example, the Tesla Model Y has, like, two scroll wheels, a uh, few window switches and one screen, that's about it. And this is a trend I think has made cars, especially functionality, a lot worse. Chances are, since you're watching this video, you may actually be interested in purchasing a used electric car. And that is where today's sponsor, Car Vertical, really comes into play. Car Vertical lets you run a report on a car you may be interested in purchasing to see if the car has ever been stolen, damaged, had an odometer rollback, or has been messed with in any way. Take, for example, this Volvo XC40, which actually doesn't come up with 
any reported damage in the car vertical report. But because we searched the VIN of this car, we found that in the report, this car has actually been damaged if you look at these photos. It has actually been in a collision, a pretty bad one. And you would know that looking at any other database because the report wouldn't come up and you would definitely not know it without running a car vertical report. And that is where this tool is so useful. So play it safe when purchasing your next new electric car and run a car vertical report today. Use code CHRISREFA to get a 20% discount on your next car vertical report today. So a huge thanks to Car Vertical for sponsoring this video. Number four on the list is glossy black plastics or piano black plastics, whatever you want to call them. And this seems to be a trend that is going away in a lot of cars, but you still have manufacturers like Audi with the A6 e-tron, which was released this year with the glossy black plastics on the door, on the center console. It gets scratched easily. It gets dusty and full of fingerprints and just doesn't look pretty or even modern in 2025. Like this was maybe cool like 10, 12, 13 years ago when we first saw it. But this is a trend I don't know anybody who likes. Not No consumer, no car reviewer, nobody likes glossy black plastic. So I really don't understand why this is still a thing in 2025. Number five is maybe one of the worst and that is touch capacitive buttons. We saw this maybe very early with the Volkswagen ID cars, ID3, ID4, and it was terrible in those cars. It has gotten a lot better, for example, in the ID7. I really don't mind them, but that is the exception to the rule. For example, I have just been testing the Mercedes CLA 350. The long trip test will be out soon and also my full review, so watch out for that, guys. It's just been really busy with Christmas and I haven't had uh, time to edit that video. But that car has touch capacitive buttons, which really highlights the lack of functionality in that car. It's just hard to use. Even though they made the icons and the buttons really big and clicky, the core of how they work is still flawed. And I can't wait until time has passed and we've gone back to physical buttons and you know ended this touch capacitive button bullcrap. Number six is driver distraction alert, or it has many names, but this is a camera that monitors the driver and depending on how much attention you are paying to the road, it will beep at you. It will even, you know, stop you from using the screen or other functions. And even in some instances, it will activate the brakes in the car. And there is no consistency across the brands of how this is implemented. In some cars, it is in the background and it's first before you start, you know, really being distracted, it will start beeping at you or giving you a message. But in some cars, for example, I went to the Volvo EX30 launch uh, almost two years ago now. And when you're driving into a roundabout in a country, you know, where we drive on the right hand side, you're going to look to the left to see if car cars are coming from the left in the roundabout. The first iteration of the software in this car would start beeping at you because you were looking to the left and the car thought you weren't paying attention, but you were actually paying attention. And this has become better, but in some cars it is still really bad. And because these interiors are so minimalistic, you don't have buttons, you have to look at the screen. Some cars will beep at you for looking at the screen, changing the temperature or the song for not paying attention attention. It is just so dumb. And for example, in a Mercedes Sealy, there's no button on the steering wheel to change the song. So you have to press the screen. So you're kind of locked into this, you know, uh, action of play with the cars where the one system uh, is beeping at you for using another system. It's just a, a mess. And it's something I really don't like. And in some cars, for example, the Volvo X90 I have now, if you're on, you know, auto steer or pilot assist and you're fiddling with the screen because you want to, you know, turn off something or do some settings, it will immediately beep at you. And if it does it enough times, it won't let you use the auto steer functionality. So it takes away one safety feature because you, the car means you, thinks you were distracted, which is just completely 
insane in my opinion it makes the driving experience worse and not safer so in that car i don't even use auto steer most of the time when going on the motorway number seven on the list is wireless phone chargers which have to their credit become better in recent years but they are far from perfect and far from even being good we have a name for them in the business we call them wireless phone warmers because most of them just heat up your phone and don't really charge your your phone and in modern cars they now take up so much real estate that they take away practicality and a lot of center consoles now have you know uh, gone the tesla model 3 route which was first introduced with that car with the dual you know wireless phone charters and they all look the same and the thing is that some of them even when they work work they're charging your phone, you have them there, and I think it's a good placement. But with some of these, if you're cornering or just, you know, driving the car normally and the phone moves about, the screen lights up, distracting you. So what's the point of having a wireless phone charger that's supposed to help you with not, you know, looking at the phone or fiddling with the phone gets your attention every 10 seconds because you're driving in a city. To me, it, it's just dumb and I never use them. I always have a USB-C charger. I plug it into the charger. I could charge my phone. I can have it facing away from me. And if I want to do something like, you know, just, uh, for example, changing songs or checking directions, I can easily do that and then turn the phone away. So for me, it's just a useless function that has now become center stage in a lot of cars for worse. Oh, number eight mirror adjustment in the infotainment system. And this is something I've talked about a lot the past few years, and I've gotten a lot of flack for it because people are like, why would you ever want to adjust your mirrors? You do that once, and then some cars have 360 cameras, so you can see your wheels. Some cars do dip the, the mirrors automatically, so you can see your wheels. You don't curve them when you parallel park. Well, I'll say to those people, you've never driven any of these cars in the real world. You're watching this on a screen, on your computer, or on your phone, and you're just listening to me. You've never experienced these problems in the real world. Because if you had, you would never complain about not being able to adjust your mirror with a switch on the door as we've been able to do for decades. In my opinion, it is the single best way to adjust your mirrors because here's the scenario you're going to parallel park in a car for example this ex90 which on summer wheels has 22 inch rims you have this much tire profile and you don't want to curb your expensive large wheels so you want to dip your mirror on command because you're not parallel parking every time you're backing up you're only doing it on occasion and you want to be able to, when you're in a busy street, maybe there's a tram behind you, you're on a high street in any European city, there's a tram, and you want to be able to put the car into reverse, you want to parallel park quickly, you want to dip your mirror, maybe even when you're doing the maneuver, like, you know, doing the steering wheel with the right hand, dipping the mirror with your left hand, multitasking, and you want to, you know, get a good view of that curb and your wheels. Well, the argument may be, well, you can do that in the infotainment system. Well, there's no time. And for example, in a Volvo, you can't exit the 360 camera when you're in the infotainment system. So you have to put the car into park, you have to go into the cameras, and then you have to dip the mirror and then to put the car into reverse. You're not going to do that. That's just dumb. And you may be saying, well, you have a 360 camera. Well, in a lot of cars, that view of your camera is very small. And then you're going to look at something this small, which is your right rear wheel. Yeah, in reality, you won't be able to see that. And what if your cameras are dirty because it's winter? Your wing mirror is up here. It's not going to be dirty. Your cameras, they're lower. The real estate which the camera covers, the lens is this small. So it's just one splash and it's dirty. So I'm going to hold my ground on this. Modern mirror adjustments in the InfoSame system needs to go away. Give us the switchback. Number nine on the list is screen controls of the air vent or controlling your air vents in the infotainment system. And this may sound strange, but in my private vehicle, my daily driver the past four years, I actually have 
adjustments of the air vents on the screen, but in my car, it actually works. And that is a Porsche Taycan Cross Turismo. In summer, it diffuses the air perfectly. All the zones just get, you know, a, a really nice distribution of the heat. And in summer, the vents in the center console are in a nice place and the software redirects the air to my face, which is what I like when it is hot outside. But this car is the exception to the rule because in most cars, it really just doesn't work. For example, the Zeker 7X I recently have been testing here on the channel, it would blow cold air after heating up the cabin when you put the temperature down to like 22 degrees in winter. So it's cold outside, you heat up the cabin to 25 degrees, you're at the temperature, you put the temperature down to 22, and it starts blowing cold air at your face. You don't want cold air when it's cold outside. And I tried to redirect the air. There wasn't enough range to direct it away from my face. But because everything is done in the infotainment system, there's no turning off my vent or the center vents. There's no switch to turn them off. Even though they've moved the controls to the infotainment system, they've deleted that. So they've taken away a function which should be there. And the argument for having things in the infotainment system in software is more possibilities. But with this, that isn't the case. I've been told there's going to be a software fix for this. But if there was just, you know, a manual control where I could just, you know, redirect it away, that would solve the problem or just, you know, turn it off right on the vent. So this is just a dumb function. We didn't need it, nobody asked for it. And in most cars, it doesn't work well at all. Lastly, we have lane keep assist. And yes, lane keep assist, you can turn off in most cars, not in all cars. In this Volvo EX90 I've been driving lately, you can turn it off, but it's still not 100% defeatable, which is just annoying and dumb and frustrating, especially now in winter. You know, the roads are dirty, the lane markings aren't easily legible for the car, and the car just gets confused. And the thing about this, the lane keep is so aggressive, it just tugs on the steering wheel. And I was driving, you know, across uh, from Bergen to Oslo here after Christmas, and you're gonna cut the corners across a mountain pass, but the car's just tugging you back in the lane and it is just dangerous, it's frustrating, and you can't even turn it off in this car, which is just, ah, oh, I really hate it. I love the X90, it is one of the best cars I tested in 2025, but this function really annoys me with this car and is the reason why Lane Keep Assist, even though it is defeatable in most cars, is on this list. So let me know what you think about my top 10 list and are there things that annoy you, worse features that I forgot to put on the list or I may not be aware of? Let me know in the comment section down below. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, please drop me a thumbs up down below and for more car content, as always, please subscribe. See you guys later, goodbye.